Scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Verse 6, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? But what do you preach on when it's Thanksgiving, or any holiday for that matter? See, there are two, there are two schools of thought for preachers. One is that people expect a Thanksgiving sermon on Thanksgiving, or a Christmas sermon on Christmas, or a Mother's Day sermon on Mother's Day. So, you, you know, people are already thinking about these things, so you preach on it. The other school of thought is that <clears throat> you don't let anybody tell you when to preach what, so you preach it whenever. And maybe a Thanksgiving sermon is more impactful in March than it is in November. I really don't care one way or the other. Uh, sometimes I preach on holidays, and y'all know that, and sometimes I don't. As a matter of fact, I had a completely different lesson I was working on. It's on faith and love, and well, it's good, and you'll hear it in a couple weeks. But we had a preacher's meeting on Monday, and the topic was on Thanksgiving. <coughs> and as I took notes and we thought about all this stuff, I, out on the corner of my page, I didn't even realize I'd done it, but I'd written points down. And I'm not going to trouble you with all of them today, but I'm like, man, there's a sermon right here. And it's Thanksgiving. We'll just go ahead and do this. So uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but a roundabout way to get us to our sermon today that's not really just on Thanksgiving, just not on giving thanks, but it's this whole process of Thanksgiving. This whole process of being dependent on God and do we know and understand and realize how dependent we should be on the Lord. And if we're dependent on God, do we count the blessings that He's given us? And if we're really thankful and counting God's blessings, are we content the way we ought to be? And that's where we'll stop today. But we can go past that, right? And think about that as, as you take this lesson that we're fixing to give, but... You know, we can take contentment to complacency, and then we can start complaining, and I think that's where the children of Israel were at, right? God had blessed them, and they were great, and they were leaving Egypt, but then they got out there, and they took all God's blessings for granted, and they got complacent, and they started complaining about what they did have. And so think about that as you're thinking about being thankful and how dependent we are on God, that we don't get complacent, that we don't gripe and complain about what God has blessed us with. Clinging to God. Well, at least it's not going to be on top of our text. Being dependent on Him. Do you ever think about the disparance, uh, the dis discrepancy, not discrepancy, the disparency. No. There's a word there that I've eaten too much turkey and I can't think of it. The big gap there is between us and God. That doesn't sound as fancy, but it's what I mean. There is a huge gap between us and God, and do you ever stop to think about your relationship to the Almighty? What about where God is? We quote Genesis 1-1 a lot of times in Pew Packers. What's, what's your memory verse today? Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You ever really stop and think about that verse for a second? In the beginning. So at the start, God was already there. So God's eternal. There's a lot, a lot right there in verse 1. God created the heavens and the earth. We create stuff all the time, right? You created mashed potatoes or, you know, turkey and dressing or whatever you created this week. Right? You made it. It's compared to you, what you made is small. You ever gone outside and looked up at the stars? Stand on the beach and look at the ocean. Stand in the fields and look at the mountains. God created all of that. We are a speck on a speck, in a speck, cosmo uh, cosmologically speaking. Now, the earth is in a backwater galaxy in a backwater part of the uh, universe, and we're just nothing. 
I like Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17. I want to read it from the ESV this morning. For the Lord your God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. God is mighty. He is awesome. He is great. He is above partiality. And we know that the New Testament teaches us that God is not a respecter of persons. We're all partial to things. It's hard for us not to be partial. You know, Coke versus Pepsi. Sweet tea versus that ungodly unsweet tea. It's blasphemous. Dodge versus Chevy versus Ford. The Blues versus the Cardinals versus... We're all, we're all prefer some things. We're all, we, we all have people we prefer and foods we prefer. You know, some people don't like turkey and they'd rather have ham. Some people don't like pumpkin pie and other people are wrong. It's just, we all prefer certain things and it's, that's human. Think about, and this is one of those things that blows my mind, how big God is. God is above being partial. God is above partiality. He is bigger than partiality. He's bigger than the, he's bigger than time itself. Where are we? God is communicating his plans to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what's happening in Genesis 18. And he's negotiating or starting to negotiate with Abraham. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. And Abraham answered and said, behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. And I am but dust and ashes. Job said, how then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean when he's born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon and it shineth not, yet the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less a man that is a worm, the son of man which is a worm. God who is above time and creation and partiality in all things that we think and do and say. And we are but dust and ashes and worms. Which maybe doesn't paint that great of a picture, but think about how David says it. What is, what is man, God, that you are mindful of him? Huge, powerful, living, almighty God, and yet he not only thinks about us, but loves and cares for us. Huge, mighty, all-powerful God, us down here in dust and ashes, and God not only thinks about us and loves and cares for us, but he knows us. He knows what we think. He knows what's in our heart. He knows how many hairs are on your head. What is man, God, that you aren't mindful of him? Do we realize how dependent we are on God for everything? I'd ask for a show of hands, but everybody would have to raise. How many people woke up this morning? How many people are still trying to wake up? At least you're honest. I appreciate that. We all woke up, which means our hearts are beating and we're drawing breath. You thank God for that this morning? A lot of people didn't. The fact that you have a heart that beats is a direct result of what God gave you. The fact that you have air to breathe is a direct result of what God gave you. We think we got it all and we don't, we, everything we have comes from God. I got it. I don't need God. You need air? Yeah, you do. You need blood in your veins? God gave you that. Everything you have is from God, and we don't realize how dependent we are on the creator and sustainer of the universe. We ought to be clinging to God, completely dependent on Him for everything, but I think especially in modern times. We've lost our dependency on God. Maybe we're dependent on our smartphones now. Can't go without it. Maybe we're dependent on our cars, we're dependent on this or that, but we've lost our ability to be dependent on God, to understand that everything comes from Him, right? Every good and perfect gift cometh from above, from the God of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. That's what James teaches us. But if we're clinging to God, maybe we ought to be counting our blessings as well. We ought to be completely dependent on God. And we ought to be thankful for the things we have. And this is something that got brought up in that preacher's meeting that got me to thinking about that dependency aspect. Matthew 6 and verse 11, the middle of the model prayer. 
what a lot of people call the Lord's Prayer. And we know that we can't pray this prayer in its entirety because uh, some of these things have already come to pass. But Jesus gives us things to pray for, right? Pray for spiritual things. Pray for physical things. Pray for yourself. Pray for others. But in this prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. Do we stop and think about what daily bread means? We're going to Jamaica this summer, and I hope that you're thinking about going with us, and we provide medicine, right? 88-cent tube of Neosporin could have saved a lady's foot in Jamaica when we were there a couple years ago. She had to make a determination, do I stop and buy food today, or that 88-cent tube of medicine actually cost about 15 bucks in Jamaica. Do I buy food or do I buy medicine? There is no food at home. What I buy today is my daily bread. What they had then, they didn't have preservatives and MSG and all the stuff that we do, right? They didn't can their food and put it on a shelf and it's good for a year or two years or three years or ten years. They didn't have refrigerators to go home and store all their food. Sometimes they were able to store food for a few days, but that was it. Maybe a cold cellar where they were able to keep some of the harvest put up. But just bread daily? No. You made bread daily out of grain that you crushed up or had crushed up. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not like they went home to have a fridge and a cabinet full of food. Every day they needed food. How dependent were these folks? Lord, give us this day our daily bread. What do we have? We were talking how most of us could go home and eat for the next year and not have to go to the grocery store again. Now, you may not want to eat green beans or spam for the next six years, but you've got it in the cabinet. You could eat. How thankful are we for the things that we already have? Be anxious or careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Thank God for everything that you have. That you have, not you want, or not that you're planning on getting. But do we understand our dependency on God? Do we thank God for our breath, for our health? And you think, my health's not what it used to be, but there are folks who are not here right now because they can't be. Your health is better than theirs. Do you thank God for that? Do you thank God for your family, as aggravating as they are sometimes? Right, that's the great and the bad thing about holidays is you get to spend time with your family, right? Do you thank God for them? Do you thank God for your job? That job that you're griping about having to go back to tomorrow because you've been off for three or four days. Do you thank God for that? Do you thank God for the school and the teachers that sacrifice to teach you? Teachers, do you thank God for your students that you love and you almost love? Do you thank God for the people that you get to spend time with, the people you come in contact with that don't know the truth of God's word, that you have an opportunity to teach. These are stuff you have already. Thank God for your electricity and your running water. These are things that folks in the first century couldn't be thankful for because they didn't have. You realize we ought to be the smartest people on the face of the world because we have Google in our pocket? Any answer to any question is available to you at the touch of a button. Are you thankful for what you already have? Are you focusing on your haves and not your have-nots? Sometimes this is the problem. This is what we want to look at. It's the stuff we don't got, the stuff we want. James chapter 4, I want to read the first 10 verses. I know it's kind of long, but let's go there anyway if we will. James chapter 4, let's look at verse 1 through 10. And I think it kind of illustrates the, the issues that we have sometimes. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not here, even from your lusts that war with your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. You fight and war and you have not, because you ask not. And you ask and receive not, because you ask amiss. That you may consume it upon your lust, its wants and not needs. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world, wanting what the world has, is enmity or hostility with God? Do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusts us to envy, to have stuff we don't need and stuff we, we got no use for and stuff that just we want because other people have it? 
But he gives more grace, wherefore he say, God resists the proud, but giveth grace continually to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Be dependent on him and not all this worldly junk. Draw near to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. You double-minded, right? Because we want to serve God and we want to do all this stuff the world wants us to do. We can't. Be afflicted, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. All that's in the same context. You want and you cannot have because you ask amiss. Humble yourself before God. Be dependent on Him. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or how shall we be clothed? All these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things for itself. Sufficient today is the evil thereof. It's not about having what you want. It's about wanting what you have. Think about that for a minute. It's not about having what you want. It's all about wanting what you already have. Focusing on what's in front of you. But we don't. Two days ago was this thing called Black Friday. Tomorrow is this thing they call Black Monday. I don't know why they call it Black but it is. Black Friday, Black Monday. When we focus on all the stuff we don't have that we want. Got to have it. My kids have got to have it. My husband, my wife's got to have it. My grandparents, my friends, my neighbors, my coworkers, my boss, they got to have these things. So we'll go spend money we don't have on things we don't need. Why can't we be thankful for the things we already have? Why can't we be content which is where we're heading in just a second. Let's focus on what God has already blessed us with and not all the stuff that we don't have in this world. You're never going to have everything. So focus on what you do have. Be thankful for what you got. You can live without a $20 crock pot from Walmart or a $10 shop back from Home Depot. Your life will continue on without these things. Is it wrong to have them? Is it wrong to go shopping? Is it wrong to plan and want? No. But it is wrong if we don't stop to appreciate what we have and thank God for it. It's wrong if we don't recognize our dependency on God and everything that we have from Him. It's wrong if we put those things in front of God. It's wrong if we can't learn to be content. And I say coming to contentment because we have to learn to be content with life. That's what Paul teaches. He said, not that I respect and respect for want, for I have learned, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am to be content. To be content in that state of life. When we go to our scripture reading of Hebrews 13. Let your conversation or your manner of life be without covetousness. You know, coveting, desiring, being jealous of things, wanting what somebody else has. And be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What do you need if you got Christ? What do you need if you got God? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Your stuff will leave you. Your stuff will forsake you. It will die. It will quit working. It'll break. God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's hard. Contentment is hard because we live in a capitalistic, materialistic society where we want it all and we want it now, and that's what all the cell papers are trying to tell you. That's what all the advertisements are trying to tell you. That's what all the emails you're getting from Amazon are trying to tell you. You need it, and you need it now. And then they try to sell you this thing, right? This Alexa, this box that you talk to, and it orders all your food or your stuff for you don't even have to shop anymore you just say hey electronic device buy more dog food and then you don't have to shop anymore you just tell this thing and it buys stuff for you 
They're not even just trying to sell you stuff. They're trying to sell you stuff that will sell you more stuff. In a society like that, how do you learn to be content? In an app store with a million bajillion things you can download and buy, how do you be content? With places like Amazon and Walmart, how do you be content? With the people up the road who have more inflatable Snoopies in their yard during Christmas than you do, how do you be content? It's something we learn. It's something we study about. It's something we are humbling ourselves to do. And that's the key. And that's something we don't like to talk about. Contentment comes with humility, right? It's not about being better than everybody else. It's not even about being equal with everybody else. It's about being you. And you with God. And that's good enough. Be content with such things as you have, for I will never leave you nor forsake you. You practice contentment with life. Paul tells Timothy that godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us, having food and clothing, let us be content. Oh, now. But Paul didn't say a house, or a car, or an iPhone, or cable, or a Netflix subscription, or Spotify, or any of the other things we can't live in life without. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You didn't bring anything in. It is certain you're not going to carry anything out. If you got food and you got clothing, be content. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I think, kind of illustrates this. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen to be a soldier. And if any man strives for masteries, yet is he not crowned, extrive he strives lawfully. Soldiers live a sparse life, right? They don't have all the, the pleasantries of home. But that's the life they've chosen. They're content with that. It takes sacrifice. A man who strives for masteries, whether it's as a soldier or a runner or a ball player, it takes sacrifice. It takes practice. It takes humbling ourselves so that we can be exalted some other way. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That practices contentment with what we have. Understanding that we sacrifice some things to have other things. Soldiers sacrifice their freedom so that we can have freedoms, right? They go where they're told, they do what they're told, they eat what they're told, they live in this military lifestyle for years so that the rest of us can feast out on Thanksgiving dinners, spend time with friends and family with these soldiers, don't they? Sacrifice that so that we may have it. We sacrifice stuff in this world because our treasure should be laid up in heaven and not on earth. Dependent on God. Learning to count our blessings and being content with what we have, I think that's something we can learn from, from Thanksgiving at large. I think it's something we need to practice daily, though. Right? It's not just a time in November where we talk about this. Maybe I'll come back and preach the same lesson in March. I don't know. So it's impactful again, but think about it. And it's not just being content because contentment leads to complacency. And then we start to complain. You know, this is last year's iPhone, guys. They make new iPhones that I don't have that have better cameras than this. You know, first world problems. First world problems. We complain about the blessings that we have. We complain about our house. Some people don't have houses. We complain, complain a lot. Contentment with godliness is great gain. Don't let it go farther than that. Don't get complacent in God's blessings. Don't fail to remember where they came from and how you got them. Don't complain about what God's given us. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Let's think about this for just a minute. What we have is from God. What we have is God's blessings. 
what we have should be a dependency on God. How has God blessed you this morning? Think about it. How has God blessed you this morning? I'm not even talking about this week or what you did this, this weekend or your holiday. I'm just talking today, this morning. It's almost 11 o'clock. You've been up for three, four, five hours maybe. How has God blessed you today? Start, count. You can take your shoes off if you need to. I'll wait. How has God blessed you? You're breathing. You're alive. You have the health necessary to be here. I hope and I pray that you're sitting with family and with friends. You have God's word, his completed revelation that tells you how to get to heaven. Hopefully you're here and you've become a Christian and you have those blessings. You have that peace that passes understanding. You're sitting in a climate-controlled building on a padded pew. You ever been to a congregation that had padded pews? That'll make you count that blessing you're sitting on right now. You don't have to flip through the pages of a song book. All the songs appear right here. Just... Man, we could be here all day, right, just counting the blessings we've had in the past four or five hours. Did you eat breakfast? Then you're already well above a lot of other people in the world and a lot of people in this country. You got plans to go, go out to eat for lunch? Or maybe you have more food than you could possibly handle this weekend and you still got a refrigerator full of it. And you're going home to eat leftovers. You know what kind of a blessing leftovers are? That you had more food than you could eat and you got more of it? And the refrigerator and all the things that keep your leftovers fresh so you continue to eat them for days. I love Thanksgiving, man. It's my best two weeks of the year when you eat turkey all the time. That's just how God's blessed us. And we could keep on, right? All of our fingers, all of our toes, tech marks on a page to fill a notebook full of the blessings we have. Did you get here in a car? Well, you're ahead of a lot of folks. Have gas to put in it? Is it running? But it doesn't run great and it's... Yeah, you know, I like my truck. My, my truck's got rust on it. I complain sometimes about the rust on my truck, but it runs. And to get me wherever I want to go, I shouldn't complain. How has God blessed you? Could you even count them all? Just how God's blessed you this morning. What have you done for God? He's done all this for you. What have you done for Him? Have you opened up His Word and studied it? He gave it to you so that you could have it. It's the power of God unto salvation. That's what Paul says in Romans 1.16. Have you opened God's Word? Have you studied it? Have you obeyed it? Not only has God given us His Word through His Spirit that we have all things that pertain to life and to godliness, but He sent His Son to die so that we could go to heaven, so that all of our sins could be washed out, could be canceled out and erased, taken away forgotten and forgiven by God. Out of all the blessings that God has given us, that's the greatest. Salvation. God's given it to you. Have you taken him up on that? If not, you need to. Don't leave here today without becoming a Christian and having your, your sins washed away, but do you live righteously? Godliness with contentment is great gain. You say, well, I'm pretty content with what I have, but you have you added godliness to that? How have you shared his blessings. What if you become a Christian? Have you done anything to share the blessings that he's given you? Has you shared the blessing of the gospel of Christ with someone else? Have you taken God's physical blessings and helped somebody else in some way that way? Maybe God has blessed you emotionally, right? With a family, with happiness, with joy, with, with contentment. Have you taken and shared that with somebody else who's lacking in those things? To build up somebody else who needs encouragement. You got food. Did you share food? Think about it. Think about all the way that we have blessed and how dependent we are on God and how we ought to be just so content with the things He's given us. And when we stop to count our many blessings, name them one by one, I think it will surprise you what the Lord has done. As you think about that and you have a need, come as we stand and as we sing.